Today, as we look at Genesis chapter 44, we're going to see another real practical way of dealing with toxic people, with some of the amazing skills that Joseph has. We're going to discover that you need to discern who you're talking to before you decide what you're going to do. That you don't handle every person the same way. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, it outlines there's three types of people that you might interact with in your family, in yourself, in your kids, in your colleagues. And I think this frames a lot of the way we can understand what Joseph is doing with his brothers. He who corrects a scoffer, there's our first type of person, gets shame. So the Bible says when you get face to face with a scoffer, you try and correct them, you end up with shame. Why would that be? Because you're dealing with a scoffer or a fool. What happens is if you bring light, feedback to a fool, the fool does not want to change. So he gets mad at you, right? Have you ever tried to give feedback to somebody? And when you brought them the light to help with their life, they got mad at the light. They wanted to adjust the light to their life, not their life to the light. And so the Bible says when you're dealing with, discern that you're dealing with a scoffer, decide what to do. You don't actually correct them. You're going to get shame. The scoffer or the fool only understands two things, consequences and boundaries. The second type of person that the Proverbs talks about, he who rebukes a wicked man harms himself. The second type of person is a wicked person. Be careful even interacting with a wicked person because they're going to harm you. The way you deal with a wicked person is guns and lawyers. <laughs> you protect yourself from the wicked person. And Joseph has lost 22 years of his life because of the wickedness of his brothers. Again, it reiterates, do not correct the scoffer lest he hate you. However, when you're dealing with somebody who's wise, you can rebuke them. You can give them feedback. You can challenge them because they will love you for it. Because when you bring a wise man light, they adjust their life to the light. Well, as Joseph is going to interact with his brothers, he is going to find out over the last 22 years, of, have they become wise He wants to re-engage with them. He wants to forgive them. He wants to reconnect with them. Before he decides what to do, he's got to discern who he's talking to. Are his brothers still wicked? Have they moved from wickedness to foolishness? Or have they finally become wise? So he's going to give a series of tests, three tests, to build on the tests he did a couple weeks ago. And then we're going to find one transforming truth. And as we're looking at that, I'm hoping that as we apply these lessons to our life, We can save a lot of time. We can save a lot of money, not wasting and investing in somebody who's going to resist our correction anyway. And we can save ourselves a lot of pain. Three tests, one transforming truth. And along the way, we're going to put down a series of clues that are embedded in the text that point to this transforming truth at the end. The first test that Joseph gives with his brothers is he tests toxic people with boundaries. He gives very clear boundaries as he's instructing his steward. He commanded the steward of his house, saying, here's what I want you to do. Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry. Put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also, I want you to hide my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack. Now, notice he doesn't call it the top of the stack. He calls it the mouth of the sack twice. We're going to write that down as our first clue to something going on later. Is the word mouth. The second thing that he decides to put of all the things he owns, he puts into the sack his cup, his silver cup. That's our second clue of the transforming truth. And it goes on. And into the sack of the youngest and his grain money. Now what he's going to try and test for is find out whether or not these brothers are willing to put their lives on the line to protect their younger brother like they didn't do 22 years ago. So that's the test he's creating, the boundaries he's creating to test whether or not his brothers have changed. So he, the steward, did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. Now, why mention the donkeys? We're going to just put that down as a clue. Often when you're reading literature in the Bible, the details have some meaning or purpose. And when you're studying or cross-referencing a verse... You can often go to the first time a particular word occurs in the Bible to see if it has any significance. But we'll get to that. But for right now, we're going to put that in the second column under donkey. Why is that significant? So here he is testing them with boundaries and says, I want you to put uh, the, the money. I want you to put the grain back into the silver cup. I want to see how they respond to this test. Next verse. When they'd gone out of the city, 
Now, they're going out of Egypt. Here's another clue we have. They've now gone out of Egypt. And we're not yet far off. Joseph said to his steward, all right, they've left Egypt. Get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is this Is not this the one from whom my Lord drinks? You have the cup that the Lord drinks from and with which he practices divination. You have done evil in doing so. So let's write our clues down and we'll talk about it in a second. Evil for good is in the text. This is not just a cup. This is the cup that the Lord drinks from. We'll write that down. The Lord drinks. And this is the one by which the Lord practiced divination. Now, what is divination? That's another one of our clues. Divination is the practice of fortune telling or telling the future. Now, sometimes it's used in the Bible, uh, very rarely, but used in a good way of somebody who can assess events through discernment and they can guess patterns to know what's going to happen based on patterns. Most of the time, divination is something that's an abomination to God. It's consulting the dead, consulting evil spirits, fortune-telling, horoscopes, things like that. And God says, I don't want you to have anything to do with that. Now, most commentators think that Joseph is actually pretending to, that he controls the future, that he knows all, to see whether or not they will come forth and be honest about what they did with him. So most commentators believe he didn't actually practice it. It's part of this elaborate ruse he's using to test them. You have done evil in doing so if you stole the king's or the the pharaoh's or Joseph's silver cup. Now, what I love about this is Joseph has put the scenario in place to test them to find out how they're going to handle the boundaries of the circumstance he's put in place. Well, the second thing we notice is that he specifically connects the consequences to the boundaries. So he overtook them and he spoke to them these words. And they said to him, Why does the Lord say these things? Far be it from us that the servant should do such a thing. So the first thing I love about this is whenever you're dealing with toxic people, they never want to respond to consequences or boundaries. I can't believe you wouldn't trust me. I can't believe you'd want me to do that. I can't believe you'd even say that, right? He said, what do you mean you can't believe it? Last time you hurt me, last time you didn't follow the boundaries, last time you were toxic, and you don't say it that way, but right? You're saying, what do you mean far be it from you? You've got a history of patterns that are bad. You've got a history, a track record of problems. Well, you're just overly sensitive. You're just... So they immediately react to the boundaries in a very unhealthy way. The second thing they notice is, why does my Lord say this? They're just shocked. I'm just shocked. Shocked that you would do this. Shocking is what this is. Secondly, far be it from us. We would never do this kind of thing. Again, toxic people never want to respond to accountability. Oh, you've never handled this. And Joseph's got to be thinking to himself, you sold me into slavery. You listened to me cry in a pit. And while I cried, you ate dinner. Far be it from you? I don't think so. Now Remember, Joseph did some testing two chapters ago. He could have said, hey, check, but he doesn't want to make the same mistake he did last time. He wants to long, he wants to reconcile, but he wants to test and make sure that they have changed before he reengages with them. It's a whole series of tests. The third thing we notice is that they're sort of exaggerating the, the truth. They say, look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sex. Well, that's technically true. Let's not forget it was their dad's idea. Their dad told them to do that. It wasn't initiated by them. However, we do see some signs that they have changed as we continue on the passage. But here's what I want you to notice. They actually respond to the steward by saying, listen, we will respond to consequences if we've crossed the boundaries. With whomever of your servants it is found, now this is the brothers talking, let him die. Well, that's some pretty serious consequences. But they are saying, we are so convinced that we wouldn't do this, that we are willing to submit to boundaries and we're willing to submit to consequences. Whoever did it will die and the rest of us will be your slaves. Well, that's a very different from pushing the blame off to Joseph years ago, isn't it? So something's beginning to happen. Something's beginning to change. Something's going on inside them. Continues in verse 10. And he said, now also let it be according to your words. This is the steward saying, all right, here's the boundaries. Here's the consequences. Let's run the test. He with whom it shall be found shall be my slave. Now, notice the grace already. We're not going to kill him. He's just going to be our slave. And the rest of you will be blameless. So we even see grace as the steward is saying, your consequences of boundaries were a little too severe. Because, by the way, wait till you see what's going to happen. 
Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground and opened his sack. So again, they're pretty convinced. They're opened up very, very quickly. Now, you tell what can be so helpful about setting boundaries and consequences, whether you're a parent and you're setting up boundaries and consequences for children or whether it's with employees or whether it's friends or whether it's with toxic people. The boundary becomes a way to make tough decisions a lot easier because it's no longer about how you feel or I feel. It's here's what we agreed to. In fact, uh, Tony Dungy found this in uh, 1998. The Colts had an incredible opportunity. They had a first round NFL draft pick. They were down to two people. They're trying to decide should they go with Manning or should they go with Leaf? Both were very talented, both had a lot of skills, but they really began to look and said, we got a standard. And part of the standards for our team is we want really strong inner character, not just talent, not just ability. We want character. And as they began to evaluate these two uh, potentials, Tony Junji had written on Leaf's uh, draft sheet, D-N-D-C, do not draft because of character. And with a lot of opinions going out there, he felt strongly that the standard of character they had set meant that Leaf wouldn't be the one they would hire. And it helped make that decision easier for him because they had a very clear standard. And if you weren't above the standard, you couldn't be on the team, no matter how talented you were. Ultimately, we know what happened with Manning from that point on. So consequences and boundaries make life easier, make easy, tough decisions easier because the standards become objective, not subjective. The third thing that Joseph tests for, which I think is important, is he tests for empathy. So he searched. And notice how the steward sets up the drama. He begins to open up the sacks from the oldest to the youngest. See, he knows the youngest has it. So it was a big one. <gasps> Safe. <gasps> Safe. <gasps> Safe. 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 <gasps> ding, 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 ding. Oh. <gasps> The youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And here comes a sign that they're beginning to change. Then they tore their clothes. This was a sign of grief. They are finally identifying with somebody else's pain, somebody else's consequence, somebody else's position. Rather than not even hearing Joseph when he was crying in the pit, they're saying, if our brother's in trouble, we're in trouble. Well, these guys have changed. And Joseph is testing for empathy. Can they empathize with somebody else? Will they identify? Will they mediate with somebody else? And each man loaded his donkey. Another clue. Let's write that one down. They loaded their donkeys. Why does it mention the donkey again? And they returned to the city. They returned to Egypt. So first they were out of Egypt, and now they're returning to the city. He looked for empathy. Now, this is important, especially as you're interacting with folks. You want people who are continuing to grow in the, in the uh, ability to have empathy for others, to mourn with those who mourn, to rejoice with those who rejoice. In fact, the University of Surah did a study and found that narcissism, which we all have a tendency to have, you know, some of us are, have, have worked on it, some of us have it full blast driving the car, but narcissism is the inability to actually have empathy because everything's about you, your life, what happens to you. And yet what they did is they did a control group and found that those who had narcissistic tendencies or selfish tendencies, when they were taught the skill of going through a particular day or a particular week and asking this question, how would I feel if I was them? Over and over again, how would I feel if I was them? They found that over a period of weeks and tests, that if you asked yourself that question regularly, how would I feel if I was them? If I was the boss, if I was an employee, if I was the parent, if I was the child? They found that even narcissists, extreme narcissists, could begin to learn how to have empathy and change. I think that's a lot what God has been doing with Judah. Judah, who was a complete narcissist by selling off his brother and not even listening to his cries, then had to come in chapter 38 face to face with how his actions hurt himself, hurt Tamar, uh, hurt his whole tribe. And God used that for him to begin to see the pain he's caused and to develop and grow him into what we're going to see today. Notice, here's the speech he gives. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can practice divination? And here's that word again. The ability to see what's going to happen in advance. Divination. Then Judah said, and notice Judah speaking up, Judah, evil Judah, 
is the first to step out and speak on behalf of his brother. What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? Do you see the change already? It's not he, he, he did it. He stole it. So sorry, Benjamin. Guess you'll have to be here. It's not a he, it's a we. He's beginning to identify with other people's pain. He's beginning to empathize and have compassion toward his brother's condition. Joseph is seeing a change. It's not a he, it's a we. He says, in fact, there's a connection here between what's going on here and something we did years ago. God has found out the iniquity or the sin of your servants. We are not guiltless. We are not innocent. Here we are, my Lord's slaves. We're going to do what you said. We promised if you found it, we'd be your slaves. I'm going to submit to the consequences. Both we, and there's a we, and he, also with whom the cup was found. And look at the connection here between the sin and the cup. It's like when you drink the cup, take the consequences, you're drinking of your sins. And here we have another clue that the sin is connected to the cup. Let's keep going. But he said, now this is so key. Look what Joseph does. Joseph gives them the ultimate escape route. You can be free, but the younger brother's got to face the consequences. But he said, far be it from me that I should do this, Joseph says. The man in whom the cup was found, he'll be my slave. The rest of you, go in peace to your father. Get out of jail free card. No consequences. You got your food. You got your money. You got my blessing. Be Be free. Will they take it or will they mediate for the younger brother? Wow, this is a big test, isn't it? Let me talk a little bit about that silver cup. The silver cup they found was used in Egypt. It was called a divination cup. And it was used water we placed in the cup. And because it was used for fortune telling by the, the foreign gods, it was uh, almost always owned by nobles, which again tells us that Joseph was very, very affluent at this point in his career. And he had one of these. Very, very valuable, but, but small enough it could fit in a sack. You would put water in it and practice what's called hydrons, hydromancy. Hydromancy. There it is. Hydromancy. Which was the water would, would hit the, uh, the silver and it would create light and supposedly the person would go into a trance and be able to tell the future. So that's what this article is that he's using and it's been hidden in here. Thirdly, the Hebrew word for this is goral. Many think that later on the traditions and rumors and uh, myths about the Holy Grail come from the goral that is this divination uh, bowl that he hides here. Whatever it is, Joseph again is saying, hey, I know the future. You can't get one over me. Don't try and fool me. Don't try and look past me. It's time to come clean. But like I said, most commentators think he's acting. He didn't actually practice this. The other thing we notice about this chapter is the entire chapter is set up with, with what's called a chiasm. Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas, it doesn't rhyme sounds. The entire chapter is a giant poem. I color-coded the ideas to see how they rhyme. So I won't go through the whole thing except to say the colors rhyme with each other. So I'll start at the top. Brothers fall to the ground before Joseph by the way of the silver cup. Later in the chapter, Judah substitutes himself for Benjamin by drinking figuratively the silver cup. Judah acknowledges the guilt of his brother here, and that rhymes with Judah's basis for Joseph's uh, reversal in verse 32. Joseph's judgment, Benjamin will remain, rhymes with the consequence but if Benjamin does not remain in verse 30 and 31. The whole thing is starting to point to the main point of the passage. Bring him down to me, rhymes with we cannot go down in verse 26. So the whole thing points to this is the question the chapter is asking us. Unless your younger brother goes down with you, you shall not see my face again. Your brother's in trouble unless somebody mediates for him. So who will do it? Will they do it? Will they mediate? What will happen? Will he get loose? And that brings us from the three tests to this transferable truth. Judah. Judah is going to intercede for Benjamin on behalf of the father. Then Judah, we'll write that one down. Judah intercedes for Benjamin, is our next clue. Came near to him and said, Oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in the Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant. For you are even like Pharaoh. I recognize your power. My Lord asked his servants, Remember you told us, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father. 
an old man, a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead. He is alone, is left of the mother's children. And his father loves him. And you said to us, your servants, bring him down to me, and I, will, I need to set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to us, you made it very clear, the boundaries were clear, the consequences were clear. If we want more food, unless the younger brother came down here, you would not see our face. You would not give us a hearing. And here again we see Judah interceding with Benjamin. Keeps going. So it was that when we went up to the servant, my father, that we told him the words you said, we were very clear. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we can't go down unless our younger brother's with us. Then we'll go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out for me, that was Joseph, and I said, surely he's torn to pieces, and I've not seen him since. But if you take this one, if you take this one also from me, you shall bring down my gray hair to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, does Judah talk to Joseph still? When I go back to my dad, and if Benjamin is not with us, since his life is bound up in my, my lad's life, since they've got such a close relationship, it will happen. When he sees the lad is not with us, I promise you, he will die. So your servants will, will bring down the gray hair of your servant. Our father will sorrow to the grave. Our father will go to the grave. Our next clue. And here again we see Judah with incredible empathy. He's watched his dad sorrow for 20 years and not come out with the truth. But now he's saying, my actions matter. If I don't do something now, my father is going to die with grief. I've got to intercede. I've got to step up. I've got to be the one in this moment. And then he gives this speech in the next two verses that is so powerful. For your servant became surety for the lad of my father. I promised him. I would bring him back or that my life was on the line. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame. Let's write that one down. Bear the blame. Now, therefore, since I bear the blame for anything he does, please let your servant remain instead of the lad. Figuratively saying, I will drink the cup that Benjamin's supposed to drink of the consequences. For how shall I go to my father if the lad is not with me? lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. And, he, and here's the transition. He went from he is the problem to we are in this together to me. I will take the blame. I will intercede. He who is innocent, who is proclaimed guilty, that can't happen. I who am really guilty will take the blame on his behalf. I will drink the cup instead of him. So what do all these clues point to? Well, let's start with the first column. This whole passage points to an ultimate Judah, an ultimate mediator that steps in for you and I. The mouth of the cup, a cup that we all must drink, a cup of evil that we did unto those who were good evil, a cup that the Lord needs to drink himself, the cup of iniquity, that we need to drink the consequences of our own actions. And what we need in order to not drink that cup is for someone to intercede for us, lest our father go to the grave. Someone needs to bear the blame for us instead of us. Think about that when we move to the next category. Why is this donkey in here? Well, if you do a cross-reference search, the last time donkey showed up was back in Genesis. Not 44, but back in Genesis 22. There's been no mention of donkey until suddenly you get to Genesis 44. Back in Genesis 22, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. The last time we heard of a donkey was when there was a father who had to take his son on a donkey and go and sacrifice him to the ultimate sacrifice for the world. And this donkey is telling us about the sacrificial needs we all have, that somebody has to ride a donkey on our behalf. 
Now jump forward. Same word donkey shows up again in chapter 49, right in the middle of a passage about the coming Messiah from Judah. Look what it says. The scepter, the Messiah, the forgiver, the fixer will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and he's clothed in the blood of in the blood of grapes. And now we begin to see that this promise that we need someone to ride our donkey, someone to load up our donkey on our behalf to be our Messiah, to be our forgiver, to be our fixer, to give us what we ultimately need. Well, what about that cup? If you search the New Testament, the cup's only mentioned a few times by Jesus, who is always teaching on the Old Testament. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, do you not know what you're asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Referencing back to this idea of drinking the mouth from the cup back in the Old Testament. Can you drink the consequences of what you've done? You see, for all of us, we have repaid God evil for good. And yet God sees the evil we've done and he repays good for our evil. And therefore, instead of we drinking the cup of iniquity that we need to drink, instead the Lord drinks the cup on our behalf. How does he do that? He, the descendant of Judah, intercedes for Benjamin, that's you and I, so the father has to go to the grave to bear the blame instead of us. If only the Old Testament spoke of Jesus. And that same Jesus, in John chapter 12, found himself a young donkey. A donkey, just like Isaac. A donkey, just like the men. A donkey. And he, a couple things. One, he was once taken to Egypt. You remember in in the Gospels, he's called out of Egypt, I called my son. Jesus is the ultimate exodus. He exits us out of sin, just as he called his people out of Egypt, just as he called the brothers out of Egypt, just as he himself got called out of Egypt. And he, too, knew in advance all this would happen. He predicted it in advance. He prepared it in advance. And he returned to the city. And all four Gospels talk about a descendant of Judah that will go to the city on our behalf. And he will be crucified. And do you know where they built Jerusalem when Solomon constructed it? He built it on the very site that Abraham had sacrificed Isaac. Knowing in advance that we all would need a Judah to mediate for what we needed. And the reason I call this a transforming truth is when you see God's brilliance, when you see God's wisdom, when you see his power, when you see his grace, when you see he prepared everything you would ever need and put himself in your place, you say, God, you are such a master of holding two things in your hands, grace and truth. He didn't compromise the truth in any way. He just brought grace in place. In dealing with toxic people, many of us have a tendency to be all grace. We'll give them another try, give them another try, give them another try. Boom, 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 and harm comes to us. Others of us are like, I'm not putting up with that. Truth. Don't take nothing from nobody. No nonsense. But in the book of John, we're told that Jesus was full of grace and truth. He deals with toxic people all the time. You and me. And he does it with an incredible blend of grace and truth. And I think the call for you and I is whoever we're dealing with, whether they're foolish, whether they're wise, or whether they're evil, that because of what he did for us, because of his patience, his mediation, because of his relentless pursuit of us, even when we turn our back on him, God is asking us to take those same tools, grace and truth, and use them with those we interact with. God's calling us to be a Joseph that helps transform a Judah in our life. Maybe you have a Judah and he's not interested in spiritual things at all and yet you're going to be the source of love. You're going to be the source of walking out, living proof of who God is. Maybe for you it's a a child who's really in rebellion. And part of that rebellion is you're going to have to put consequences in place and boundaries in place and you're going to have to very lovingly say and work with that over years to help transform this Judah And have their heart changed. And God wants to use you. 
If you would ask anyone back in chapter 37, do you think Judah has got a hope and a prayer? <laughs> no. But God wants you to be the Joseph that works with your kids and your colleagues and your friends and your neighbors to see God work in the midst of them. But I think you can't look at this passage without looking in the mirror and saying, maybe I'm a Judah. Hmm. In fact, there's a lot of me that's a Judah. Maybe for many of us, we need to say, I need to submit myself to some boundaries. I need to submit myself to some accountability with my anger, some accountability with my attitude, some accountability with my finances, some accountability with, with my, my, my temptations. I need, if I'm going to change, I've got to submit myself to some boundaries and stop pointing fingers and saying, I can't believe that you'd give me any consequences and ask somebody to help me with consequences. Or maybe part of you being a Judah is that you've heard for years, or you haven't heard, or you haven't done anything about it. People say, I wish you could see it from my perspective. I wish you could just feel where I'm coming from. And you're like, maybe the thing that God wants you to do is because of what God did for you, See, Jesus ultimately said, how would I feel if I was them? Wow, I'd need a mediator. Maybe for you, you need to say, wow, God, I want to develop the skill of compassion and empathy. God, use this in my life. I'm going to start asking, how would I feel if I was them? God, develop that side of me. Whatever it is, God wants to work in your heart. He wants you to be a, a Joseph to other Judas, and he wants to be your Joseph, whatever stage of Judah you're in as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the powerful, powerful message. Practical, yet powerful that you would love us no matter where we are. You would work with us no matter where we were. And God, that you would be the ultimate glory, the ultimate source of our love and joy. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thanks so much.